Dragons Dogma 2. Reviews are out right now. 89 open critic average, 95% of critics recommending this game. Another stellar outing for Capcom in what is one of the most unlikely sequels to exist. We have the global unlock times on screen right now for those of you who pre-ordered. Just subtract 12 from the time on screen and find out when this game unlocks for you. I'm showing the console times now. Me personally, I cannot wait to dive in. Unfortunately, I did not get review code access to this one. It seems like everyone else did, but I unfortunately did not. I apologize to all of you because I know many of you look out for my reviews and I try my best. I apply for everything, but this year, your boy's been snake bitten. I don't know how else to put it, so I I know it's a privilege i'm not going to complain too much but i apologize if you look forward to my reviews that i'm letting you down i'm trying my best but it's truly out of my hands and i'm still going to deliver impressions for the game probably after the weekend of playing it but nonetheless really excited for dragon's dogma 2 and in today's video we're going through everything we know so far now with the reviews out we got the verdict on frame rate gameplay class structure what's the map size like we're going through all of those details without any spoilers on everything you need to know before you play Dragon's Dogma 2. So not too long now, if you're new here and you're into Dragon's Dogma 2, we're gonna be doing some content leading up to its launch and afterwards, consider subscribing. Let's start off at the top. Frame rate was something that I did warn people about when I was talking initially about Dragon's Dogma 2 and how I have some concerns. That was because it was confirmed there were no visual settings on consoles, it's uncapped frame rate, they're gonna float around 30 FPS, and with a game that can get as busy on screen is Dragon's Dogma 2. Naturally, I had my worries, and they seem to be firmed up where even going over to PC may have its problems as Capcom is aware of Dragon's Dogma 2 frame rate issues on PC and are looking into fixes. This came out immediately after the reviews. Responding to a query about frame rate problems from IGN, Capcom said in a statement that performance issues on PC may be linked to the heavy amount of CPU demanded from NPCs in the game. Quote, in Dragon's Dogma 2, a large amount of CPU usage is allocated to each character and dynamically calculates the impact of their physical presence in various environments. In certain situations where numerous characters appear simultaneously, the CPU usage can be very high and may affect the frame rate, a Capcom representative told IGN. We are aware that in such situations, settings that reduce GPU load may currently have a limited effect. However, we are looking into ways to improve performance in the future. You can see here on screen are the system requirements for Dragon's Dogma 2. Underneath the recommended section, you look at i7 processor, RTX 2080. The demand isn't so high that it should be impossible to get pretty consistent frame rate here. It seems a lot about optimization. This reminds me a bit about what happened with Baldur's Gate 3 at launch where my PC, I distinctly remember, I stayed away from the game for a little bit because it was running extremely hot to the touch and until they optimized it more, it ran better, looked better, and my PC didn't feel like it was about to set on fire. But this all stems back to some of the warning shots, if you will, like when Game Informer had reported back on March 5th that Dragon's Dogma 2 had an uncapped frame rate and no visual presets or modes on consoles. So fingers crossed they fix this one, but it's something you want to be aware of up front. I'm usually not the technical know-how warning guy when it comes to my content. I focus more on like the gameplay and the story and the sound and break those down. But I feel like in today's day and age where we see things like great games such as Star Wars Jedi Survivor coming out in such a broken state, you should just be aware with Dragon's Dogma 2 that the frame rate may be questionable across all platforms and that you're not really fully safe on PC. Now let's talk more about the actual content of the game itself, the story. One of the big questions going into Dragon's Dogma is, hey, do we have to play the first one to understand the second one? There are websites like Polygon telling you, yes, you should do this. It's on sale. Go ahead, check it out. And then there's sites like IGN saying, no, you don't. As someone who's played Dragon's Dogma extensively, we've done a couple of retrospectives over on it here on this channel and Retro Rebound. I would say, from what I can tell, you don't really need to play Dragon's Dogma 1 to get Dragon's Dogma 2. Not only is Dragon's Dogma 1 not a super story-focused game, it's more about the end game and the boss fights and the pawns and the exploration of this dangerous world and less about the lore, but also Dragon's Dogma 2 is in such a parallel world that you're probably going to get the Dragon's Dogma 1 experience through too. Let's read through this synopsis from IGN where they write, Dragon's Dogma 2, a sequel set in a parallel world that, quote, mirrors the world setting of the original game, end quote. 
Like the first game, the sequel's story revolves around the Arisen who embarks on a perilous journey to reclaim their stolen heart from the dragon. That's why the story of constant rebirth that's focused around dragons, as well as the various elements of the world shown in the previous game, have all carried over to this one as well. That said, it does take place in a different parallel world, which is why I think there will be parts that are similar yet different. So it's one of those situations from what I can tell and what I've watched in reviews where if you've played Dragon's Dogma 1 like say I have, there are things you're going to see and maybe appreciate. But if you haven't, you can go in and enjoy what Dragon's Dogma 2 has to offer and honestly take away a lot of what the original had given you. Especially the, the main story of the first game was you're in this nice beach town, everything's chill, all of a sudden a dragon shows up, pokes a heart out of your chest, and you're still alive. You still have a pulse somehow, and you gotta find out why, but also you gotta go get your heart back. And so that's a big part of the main story before other things happen in the end game, and there's trials you gotta go through with the Everfall and whatnot, and then there's Bitter Black Isle, which was added on with Dark Arisen, which adds even more content. I think because Dragon's Dogma has had had this, if you will, messy story history between that, the anime, the failed online attempt for Dragon's Dogma, 2 is going to be standalone and so you should be fine, even though I would recommend just before the launch of 2, as I did many times, checking out Dragon's Dogma 1 just to see if you can vibe with what the open world offers because it is very different from typical fantasy RPGs. We also have a brand new race that we're going to be encountering in Dragon's Dogma 2 known as the Beast Wren, this kind of lion looking race. But that's only the start of things because the character creator in Dragon's Dogma 2, if you haven't seen it yet, is absolutely phenomenal. Some of the creations online are just crazy looking. Like you see here, someone's made a Dunmer from Elder Scrolls. And I mean, it looks spot on. Speaking of Elder Scrolls, how about the adoring fan? Which someone, <laughs> someone recreated a pretty menacing version of him. But I mean, if he was more photorealistic, perhaps that is what he would look like. So yeah, the character creator is great. You also can see Lazel. You see here, Shadowheart. I've shown off, of course, Bully Maguire. So you can get really crazy with this. And this is important because you not only have your character and what they look like, and this is a third person game, so you get to see them all the time, but you have a pawn that you invest a ton of time into and that you can share online. So it's kind of worthwhile to make your pawn, who is your main companion, who's gonna be traveling with you the whole time, someone who's cool and you like how they look, or absolutely hilarious. There was already a demo out for the Dragon's Dogma character creator, so you can mess around with that if it's something you're interested interested in. Let's talk a bit about vocations. This is something that I think is really important to point out because this is the class structure for Dragon's Dogma. For starters, reviews have shown that it's incredibly fluid in Dragon's Dogma 2. This means that, for example, you don't get pigeonholed. You can swap between all of these vocations I'm about to list out freely and your stats will automatically allocate based on what's equipped. So let's say you're using the warrior, your stats will shift to strength. Or if you're going over to a mage vocation, then things will shift in your favor for that class. Class. So the game keeps things open and fluid and I was watching my boy fighting Cowboys review and he was switching between like three different vocations on the fly like magic archer mystic spear hand and I think warrior and he was just mixing and matching them all so you don't get pigeonholed I wouldn't say overthink your choice when you start the game off but know that as you rank up these vocations you unlock new skills and you can invest more points into those and get new abilities there will be levels of strength and there is a such thing as maxing out the vocations but you can pursue anyone at any point in time and there's certainly enough content to start getting those scaled up I learned through the Fexture Life Review that there's over 80 quests with multiple endings. One thing that Dragon's Dogma 2 does that's very different from the first game is having choice and consequence multiple ways of approaching the finale of quests, although this is an unguided open world. Very few quest markers, if any at all. NPCs approach you with quest offerings. You kind of don't find them anywhere. They're not marked on your map. You have to talk to them and naturally, organically find that content. So I think that is something you need to prepare yourselves for, kind of like maybe Elden Ring, if you will. And there's apparently also a massive endgame. So there's many opportunities for you to max out all these vocations I'm about to list out to you. It starts off with basic ones, like say the fighter, which focuses more so on one-handed swords, the sword and shield combat you kind of know and love in typical fantasy action RPGs. That's here with this vocation. Meanwhile, there are advanced vocations. Think of them as like upgrades of the basic ones that you start off with, which are four opening ones in Mage, Thief, Archer, and Fighter. One of the advanced vocations is Warrior, which focuses primarily on two-handed weapon attacks. They also can equip heavy armor. So if you like that track you're going on with say Fighter, then Warrior can be a very slower paced but defensively driven version of that depending on what archetype you really want to get into 
Meanwhile, there are archers who replace Dragon's Dogma 1's Ranger class, and it's exactly what it sounds like, right? If you want to stay at the distance, poke enemies, target weaknesses, without too much of a risk, you're definitely weaker and an easy target if a melee enemy catches up to you, but you can do some pretty good damage from a distance. Meanwhile, there are hybrids of that, like the Magic Archer I mentioned earlier, which was also in Dragon's Dogma 1. And this is a really good class for targeting weaknesses. There's a lot of auto-aim abilities. It can do some crazy damage, but it's really good for swapping in. Say, if there's an enemy flying in the sky, they have wings, you use a, a fire arrow on them, you hit those wings, and you bring them right down to the ground and maybe switch to something more melee-oriented. There's the Thief, which replaces the Strider from Dragon's Dogma 1. These are more agile classes that flip around your enemies, have a lot of AoE attacks, and you can even steal items from enemies. There's the Mage, so this is a more well-rounded, magic-focused class. You have your offensive spells, but you can also heal. You can buff your items, like applying, say, fire damage to your weapons. You can do stuff like that, but then there's an advanced vocation in sorcerer which is an all-out offensive magic class so there's options there if you're really liking mage you just kind of escalate into sorcerer uh, there's also new ones that have been introduced here in dragon's dogma 2 you have the mystic spear hand which allows you to equip a brand new weapon called the duo spear this one is a mixture of close combat with your melee weapon and distance magic. I think this is going to be an easy favorite for most Dragon's Dogma newcomers, especially because it offers that versatility. You're not really missing out on too much. It has some serious style to it. It seems like every review I've watched has had a lot of Mystic Spearhand gameplay. So I feel like this is going to be an easy pick for many of us. And I'm going to be doing the same. I think the class looks like a ton of fun. Meanwhile, they offer a brand new, more advanced, not literally under the definition of advanced vocation, but it seems to be tougher to use compared to other vocations in Dragon's Dogma because it's one that doesn't do damage, and that's Trickster. The Trickster vocation is more of a support class that uses a weapon called the Sensor, and you use smoke basically to create apparitions, and so you can use this to distract enemies so that your pawns and your allies can attack these enemies for you. You can lure them off a cliff's edge. You can distract them in a number of ways, but the trick is you don't do a lot of damage to them. So the trickster is going to take some getting used to for sure. If you're a major Dragon's Dogma expert, I feel like this class was made for you because it plays so dramatically differently from any other vocation that you find in the original game and even Dragon's Dogma 2. And last but not least, we talked about content. How big is this game? Well, Dragon's Dogma 1 was already a pretty big game. It was a pretty big game. You can spend a lot of time in it, especially with Dark Arisen and Bitter Black Isle offering so much content in the end game. And even the end game of Base Dragon's Dogma 1 just being crazy in this kind of recurring world, if you will. It was a pretty intense content offering. And they have already said over at Capcom here on their official Twitter account that this world is roughly four times the size of the first game. Now, I know some people hand wave that away and go, oh, it's a 360 game. But I promise you, that was already a pretty big game. And with a game that's four times that size that doesn't hold your hand, I'm just warning you again, this will be a pretty big challenge. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to spend 80, 90, 100 hours in Dragon's Dogma 2. In fact, IGN has reported that it took them just 24 hours to reach the final credits of Dragon's Dogma 2, including the game's optional true ending. Now, this is likely due to, and I've experienced this before as a reviewer, we sometimes have to play games in an unorthodox way, as in, you may stop, smell the roses more often than we do because we have to beat the game in, say, a week or two. So we might have to prioritize running through the main story. I think there are certain situations that make sense versus others, and you just have to communicate if the story's done or not in the review, but just know that if you are looking for an open world game that doesn't take a dramatic amount of time, it seems like you can put the pedal to the metal here in Dragon's Dogma 2, stop meandering whenever you want, and just push through the main story in just above 20 hours. So keep that in mind that while the game is four times the size, it doesn't seem like that's all attached to the main narrative, but rather, optional monster hunts the end game like that's where a lot of the content in the first game lied i wouldn't be surprised if that's the case here with dragon's dogma 2 and so that's basically everything you need to know going into this game from classes to game length to story synopsis all of that laid out for you in spoiler free fashion so with that ladies and gentlemen i look forward to hearing your thoughts what do you make of dragon's dogma 2 the reviews what are you most excited about fire away down below and with that take excellent care of yourselves and i will see you in the next video Stay sexy, stay active. I love you all. Peace.